our reading from the Bible today. The first reading was from Hosea 11, 1 through 11. God's love to Israel. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the further they went from me. They sacrificed to the Baals. They burnt incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. And I led them with the cords of human kindness, with the ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck and bent down to feed them. They will, will they not return to Egypt and will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? Swords will flash in their cities and destroy the bars of their gates and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me even if they call to the Most High. It will, be, it will by no means exalt them. How can I give you, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zimboam, Zimboam? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger nor will I turn and devastate Ephraim. For I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I will not come in wrath. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. And when he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt, like droves from Assyria, I will settle down in their homes, declares the Lord. Our next reading is in Luke 12, 13 through 21. Okay. The parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you. Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all of my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get, the, then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how you will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. Do not worry. So I'm sorry, I just want to make sure. Then Jesus said to the disciples, Therefore I will tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you are than the birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you 
Not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how, you're, is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, and is thrown into the fir- fire, how much more will he clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, and do not set upon your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pages, for the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But I, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> you know, I uh, feel. Read the, the until like verse 32, so I like it because you know uh, the after 20 verse 21 all the way to uh, 32, uh, our lectionary schedule doesn't cover that part. So uh, he just wanted to make sure that you know that is part of the whole story. So uh, I appreciate that. You know, uh, from I prepare you know, other greetings, but I want to say this. Uh, You know, from our VBS and from our experience, you know, service in camera ministry, I always feel like there is something that you never understand unless you are present in the the place and in the time. Uh, We know about church missions. We know about VBS. But there are some special feelings only you can feel inside, right, inside the, the space. So um, one, of the, one of the kids, you know, uh, in, the, uh, in the VBS in Philadelphia, I, I served. I went there. And every night we had, like, a meditation or contemplation sharing, you know, time. And one of the kids said, how come the Six-year-old little boy could hold his his, his you know tears uh, without asking any adults for help. So what it took him to uh, to be like that, you know, throughout the years that you know he couldn't find his mom or his dad in the in the place that you know he need help. So he learned how to uh, hold his tears by himself, right? By himself. So that was kind of heartbreaking for her, one of the volunteers. So that moment, I realized that there are some messages from God only we hear, we can hear in the moment and in the place. So uh, when Jesus said, go into the world, that literally means we have to go somewhere to help the people, to meet the people, to talk to the people. Then we realized that what is God up to? And then what is God doing in the world? So I hope that this place of worship is such a place. We share our love, our lives. We share our concerns and joys. And this is the moment that we only can feel when we come to this place. Not at home. Not with our own friends and family, but with the brothers and sisters in Christ. So I want to emphasize that you know, our greetings, our smiles, our, our warm words are very important, and them, they matter to each other. Now let's all rise and share our love in Jesus Christ in a very meaningful way. You know, uh, from, uh, I have uh, two quick announcements. First of all, I moved my house on Tuesday. And you will see me not wearing my, my gown for the communion because I couldn't find it. <laughs> it's in one of those boxes, trust me. So, so bear with me and forgive me for not doing that. And I know it will take forever, so I hope next month I will wear that one. <laughs> So second announcement is that I want you uh, to pray for the nation as we had so many victims for the last couple of days here in different towns 
That really breaks my heart. And then the people who are just like us, who live their life faithfully and, and meaningfully, you know, uh, just don't exist in this world anymore. So we pray for the victims and we pray for the nation to come together to, to comfort the people and the victims and their families and also to do something, you know, to prevent this kind of tragic incidents from happening again. Uh, so I want you uh, to pray, uh, you know, uh, to God for the nation and for the victims. So as you uh, read today's passage, uh, Luke chapter 12, verse uh, 12 to uh, 21, our theme for today is money, one big elephant in the room. Most probably, we all love money because money allows us to have a life we love. Many people don't want to change their attitude toward money. They think the only problem they have is that the, mon the money doesn't love them back in return as much as they love money. There was a couple that lived in the country area. The husband, his name is Paul, was very stingy and hate, hated spending money. One day a fair uh, came to the town and his wife wanted to go there because they hadn't been anywhere for a long time. Paul thought about it for a while and agreed to go there with one condition. All right, we'll go. But I'm not going to spend much money there. We'll look, look at things, but we won't buy anything, okay? So they went to the, to the fair. Even though there, there were many things his wife wanted to buy, he would not let her spend any money. Then in the nearby field, they saw a small airplane with a sign next to it. Fun flight for $50 for 10 minutes. Paul had never been in, the air, in an airplane, and he wanted to go on a fun flight. However, he didn't want to pay the same amount for his wife because he thought the second person should pay less or if nothing. He asked the, asked the pilot, can my wife come with me for free? And the pilot said, I'll make a bargain with you. If your wife doesn't scream or shout during the flight, both of you can have a free flight. If any of you scream or shout, you pay the full price. How about that? Paul agreed and got into the small airplane with his wife. The pilot took off and made his airplane do all kinds of things. At one moment, it was flying upside down. And Paul endured all of it without making any sound by holding the seat tight and clenching his teeth. When the plane landed, plane landed, the pilot said, okay, neither of you made a sound during the flight. Both of you can have a free ride. Paul said, thank you. It wasn't easy for me, but it should be much harder for my wife. She didn't scream even when she fell out. <laughs> A lot of times in life, money is not everything. Sometimes we'd rather spend some money for our new experiences than saving money in the bank. Especially for the young people, Experience is far more valuable than money will ever be. The most obvious purpose of money is to spend it. Even though people save or invest money, their purpose is, is the same. It is to have more money later 
so that they can spend it. However, some people are very good at saving money, and some people are very good at spending money, and a lot of times they are not the same people, especially in the family. In today's passage, Jesus responded to the request of a young, woman, young man who asked, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. In the ancient Israel, the children of the deceased father could, could divide the estate immediately, or they could keep it intact for a time, perhaps while waiting for a younger son to reach an adult age. Typically, the eldest son received two shares, and other sons received one share each, according to Deuteronomy 21, verse 17. So it is not clear what exactly this young man was complaining about, about his brother. There could be so many possibilities to explain why the first son did not share the inheritance with his younger brother. For example, as I said just before, if the younger son was too young to manage his, his inheritance, the older brother could keep it until he grew up. In this case, just like the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, the younger brother could have demanded his portion before the legal age to inherit it, just like the son and in the story. Or the older brother lived, in, lived on an undivided estate, and he said that he couldn't give a, give a portion until he sold the entire estate. Or simply the older brother gave a portion based on the value, based on the cash value of the time. But the younger son realized later the price of the land went up, so he needed more. In any case, it was obvious that the younger son thought it was unfair, and the older son justified his decision. But Jesus didn't seem to be interested in settling the case. As always, Jesus directed him to find a more fundamental matter. And what is it? It is about how to use the money rather than how to make money. Jesus did not say much about how to make money or how to be successful because such a desire is in our genes. And, and Jesus didn't need to say anything about it. However, to see someone how to spend money explains a lot of things about the person and his or her attitude towards a life goal. As a pastor, it is always a great challenge to consider the boundary of my sermon, especially when it comes to money. I shouldn't push too little when the Bible says it strongly, but I shouldn't push too much because people may block their ears. Most of us may, may be more interested in how to make and manage, mo manage money, not how to spend it, as if we all know about it very well. We know how to spend money. However, Jesus didn't seem to care about people's respond, response. In today's passage, Jesus told a young man a parable about a rich man. As much as this parable made a clear point, it also raised a big question mark in our minds. The man in the parable is rich, and he is not portrayed as wicked. He has not, has not gained his wealth illegally or by taking advantage of others. He is not portrayed as particularly greedy. According to verse 16, he was surprised by his good fortune to reap the abundance of the harvest. Then he thought to himself, 
what shall I do with this abundance? Since I have no place to store my crops, I'll have to tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store our story. I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and marry. And what is wrong with this man? He was lucky to gather a lot of harvest. There is nothing wrong with it. He should have some skills and knowledge and experiences to get more crops. Just like any human success story, his wealth was the result of the combination of his effort and his luck. However, his skills and efforts were not solely his in the first place. He was fortunate enough to continue his effort without having serious, serious health problems or a sudden accident. His experiences and wisdom were not solely his either because he could mean, they could mean the product of many years of experiments and failures of others. No human wisdom is gained by one person or one generation. No human wisdom is perfect because wisdom is the ability to make good decisions based on the knowledge available in the given time and place. Only God is the source of ultimate wisdom, and only God possesses all the facts. That is why Proverbs 9, 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. In verse 18 and 19, the farmer had a conversation with himself, saying, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. I'll do this. I'll put down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grains, my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and marry. Even though the last sentence was the, was the second, pronoun, second person pronoun, you, but the rich man talked to himself. So we can consider it as the first pronoun, like I or my. So in those two verses, verse 18 and 19, how many I or my you can find? 13 times. The relentless of use of the first pronoun, I or my, represents his preoccupation with himself. There is no thought to using the abundance to help others and no recognition of God at all. His world is all about himself, as if he himself, himself is the only one who made his success possible. It's not as famous as other Beatles songs, but they sang a song entitled, I, Me, Mine. I don't know how many of you have heard this song, but it's in the same album of Let It Be. The lyrics of the song, I, Me, Mine, go like this. All through the day, I, me, mine, I, me, mine, I, me, mine. All through the night, I, me, mine, I, me, mine, I, me, mine. Now they are frightened of leaving it. Everyone is weaving it, coming unstrong all the time, all through the day, I, me, mine. And the second verse, 
All I can hear, I mean mine, I mean mine, I mean mine. Even those tears, I mean mine, I mean mine, I mean mine. No one's frightened of playing it, everyone's saying it, flowing from freely, free, fl flowing more freely than wine. All through the day, I, me, mine. This is the core of human predicaments. To worry about our own well-being only is an enemy of the rest of, of the of, of an enemy of of generous stewardship. Fear is the source of unhappiness in humans, and fear is also connected to greed. Fear that I won't get mine or I won't have enough prevents us from seeing what God has done and will do for us. This me mentality also isolates us from the love of God and neighbors. I be it, it believes God and neighbors exist to satisfy their desires, and if they can do the, the work, they are not needed. As you read today's passage, you might have thought to yourself before anything else, I wish I had such money. Then I won't believe, be, I, I won't behave like the rich man. I'll share it with others and offer a big chunk of money to God. If you think like this, you don't know the whole, whole point. The question Jesus cast to, the, to all of us is where we are, where our inertia is. You see, sometimes I think the, uh, our I often think that life is all about inertia, the law of inertia. In physics, inertia means a property of matter by which it continues in, it, in its existing state of rest or uniform motion unless the state is cha changed by an external force. This is the dictionary definition, so it, it sounds very hard. But it's like this, if something stays, it tends to stay forever, right? If something is moving in the, in the, in the constant speed, if there is no, no, uh, you know, no resistance from the floor, then it will continue to move to that direction with that speed forever. That's the theory of inertia. And I think often that our life is all about inertia. We do the same work, we meet the same people, we spend our, our money in the same way. Our life is controlled by inertia. We have resistance to change in ourselves. We all know that it takes a force from outside to get us moving, to change our direction, or to stop it. As you read today's passage, you might have thought to yourself, then, you know, well, we, we need money. We, we should have money to spend for, the, for God and for the neighbors. But the, the theory of inertia tells us that life of giving and sharing becomes to follow the law of inertia, inertia as well. We give and share our money when we have little. Then we can share more when we have more. But nobody can change overnight, and nobody has this inertia all of a sudden. The point of the message is that God will find out what is left behind us as God takes our, our life, to offer our possessions to God 
and to share them with the people in need are going to represent our trajectory, life trajectory. This, that is how God measures our life. We may measure the peak of our life in our own ways. Physically speaking, our strength may peak, may reach our peak at the age of 25 and continue, continues to decline from the peak. Financially, the time we made the biggest money was our peak and declines from that point and we live, we spend our money out of that income we made with our great success. However, spiritually speaking, our peak time is when we escape from the world, world from the world of I, me, mine, and enter the kingdom of God, where we acknowledge that everything is, is the gift from God. Everything is to glorify God and to show God's, God's love and compassion in the world. In this sense, we can have many peak points in our spiritual life, and we don't have to experience any decline if we acknowledge that everything is given to us by God, and we are thankful, we lift our offers, and we share our, our possessions with our neighbors. That's the peak of our spiritual life. So unlike our physical or financial life, our spiritual life doesn't have to be declined at all. And I have hope and pray that all of us turn our eyes from me world toward the beautiful kingdom of God, the kingdom of love and the kingdom of peace. And I hope and pray we may plant a seed of peace and love in this dangerous world that is filled with hatred and fear. And we, when we share with small things, and we will avoid the fate of this rich man. Amen.